I usually go electronic when I read these, but I saw this beat up old duct taped together Bible and I love these things because it means they've been used. It reminds me of a story a preacher once said when I asked him, why do you have me open my Bible when you're going to read it to me and it's not that long? And he said, it's so you can keep me honest. Now he was obviously joking, but it's, it's um, important, I think, to open up the passage, to read the context, to read what came before it, what came after it. So after this lesson is over, um, take that chance. Our scripture today, it's going to come out of, if you have the book in front of you, page 255. It's going to be 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And this is a, a, a passage of passion. And I like when people read with passion, so I'll do my best here. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Good morning, Mr. Church. Good morning. Let the church say amen. amen. <clears throat> let the church say amen again. Amen. <clears throat> and let the church say amen one more time. Amen. All right. Let me have to wake you guys up this morning. <clears throat> All right. So let me go ahead and make an official announcement because I know you've seen an email. You've seen it in the bulletin. And I haven't said anything publicly from the pulpit about it. Yes, yes, my wife and I are pregnant. <laughs> Thank you. And you heard me correctly. My wife and I are both pregnant uh, because something weird happens during her pregnancies. I feel like I'm pregnant too. I get the exact same symptoms as she gets. So I guess we must truly be one in marriage. Uh, but please keep her and our little girl in your prayers. Um, of course, many of you know she has an at-risk pregnancy. Uh, so far, everything is, is looking great uh, for her and, and our daughter. But continue to pray. The baby will be born in April. April 20th is the due date. So please keep us in your prayers. And uh, on another note, here in front of me is a display table. I know last time I preached, a table came flying off the stage. I may or may not tip this one over, so just stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I do want to talk really quick about the family challenge of the Daniel diet. So I've put together a family challenge. The challenge starts today. So you can go ahead and register online if you want to be a part of this Daniel diet family challenge. I know many of you have made New Year's resolutions. I'm just trying to keep you honest, right? I know you're trying to eat better, lose a little bit of weight. Uh, live a healthier lifestyle. So, hey, here's an opportunity to do that for you and your family. Uh, if you register online, your packet will be available to pick up this week from the church building. So register online. I'll reach out to you this week, and you can come and pick up your packet for the challenge. All the details are on the registration site, and additional details will be in the packet. Uh, all right, so we got that cleared up. Let us turn to... 1 Kings chapter 19. And I want to invite you to the subject this morning, I've had enough. I've had enough. 2020 is a thing of the past. Amen. Amen. And here we are in 2021. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but a lot of the issues and crises in 2020 have now transitioned into 2021. Many of you know I do have a, a part-time practice as a, as a mental health therapist. And I'll tell you, after talking to many of you and talking to those in the community, many people have said to me, I've had enough. So if you've ever reached a point in your life, or if you are at a point in your life where you've had enough, this lesson is for you. Let me give you a little bit of background information regarding the text we're going to look at today. So in this particular story in 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab is king over Israel. The Bible tells us that he has carried out more evil 
than any king that reigned before him. Now, King Ahab is married to a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel was a worshiper of the false god Baal. And Ahab and Jezebel led the children of Israel away from God, Yahweh. Led the children of Israel to worship and sacrifice to the idol god, Baal. And in this context, we also have Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God, of God. Prophets had a direct one-on-one communication with God to foretell or to bring forth God's message to Israel. Their prophecies consisted of blessings, cursings, and warnings, which always 100% of the time came true. In fact, prophets usually lived a very unique peculiar lifestyle that served as an object lesson for a watching world in order to hear and understand God's message to them. So in this particular context, Elijah has arranged a great title fight between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and then Baal, or Baal, the false god of Ahab and Jezebel. So Elijah says to the worshipers of Baal, build an altar to your god, cut up a bull, lay its pieces on the altar, and tell your god to consume it with fire. And then Elijah said, then I will build an altar, and I will cut up a bull, and I'll place its pieces on the altar, And I will sacrifice to God, Yahweh. And we'll see whose God is the one true God. And Elijah says, you guys have been walking in between two opinions for too long. It's time to make a decision. Will you be a worshiper and sacrificer to Baal? Or will you be committed to God? So the battle takes place. The worshipers of Baal, they begin to call on their God to consume the bull pieces off the altar. And they begin to yell louder and louder for hours and and nothing happens. There's complete silence. And then Elijah begins to taunt them. He says, I don't hear anything. The sacrifice is still there on the altar. Where's your God at? Is he asleep? Is he on a vacation? Is he thinking about coming down to burn up the sacrifice? Where's your God? And the worshipers of Baal become more and more intense, and they're crying out louder and louder, and the Scripture says they begin to cut themselves. Nothing happens. Complete silence. Then it's Elijah's turn. Elijah approaches the altar that he built. And he tells the, some of the Israelites to come and pour water all over the altar. Build a trench around the altar and pour water in it. So Elijah's altar is drenched in water. The parts of the sacrifice, the bull is drenched in water. And then Elijah prays to God to bring down fire. And God responds. God responds with fire. The fire comes down and consumes everything. Even the water around the trench, the Bible says, is licked up by God. And now it is apparent that the false god Baal doesn't even exist. He's nowhere to be found. He has no power. And God, Yahweh, is praised. He's worshipped. And then Elijah says, bring all the prophets of Baal down, 450 of them. And the Bible tells us that Elijah gets a sword and he slaughters them all. Then Ahab runs back to his wife to tell Jezebel what happened. 
and we all heard her response. And so here we are, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, says this. Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods punish me and do so severely if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this day tomorrow. In verse 3, it says, Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. This brings me to my first point this morning. If you feel that you have had enough, I encourage you to identify the things in life that are stressing you out. Identify your stressors and do what Elijah did. Create some distance. Is that not what he did when he heard that Jezebel was out to kill him? He was in a fight or flight fear response. And what did he do with his fear? He created some distance. What are your stressors? Is it the news? Sometimes the news can stress you out. Amen. Well, create some distance. You know, you can turn it off. What about social media? Maybe there's some people in your news feed that you just do not want to see post anymore. Guess what you can do? You can unfriend them. You can block them. You can log out of your social media account. You can create some distance from your stressor. Maybe you're in a relationship. Maybe that relationship is a little toxic. Maybe that relationship is causing you a lot of emotional distress. A timeout may be in order. Whatever your stressor is, don't be afraid to create some distance from your stressor. Point number two, focus on your basic needs. When you feel that you've had enough, Sometimes your sleep is affected. When you're under a lot of stress, sometimes it's difficult to stay asleep. Sometimes it's difficult to fall asleep. Sometimes you don't have an appetite. When you're under stress, sometimes you don't feel like eating. You undereat, and other people have an opposite response where they overeat. Sometimes when you are under stress, you start to not take care of yourself the way that you know you should, where your personal hygiene becomes affected. Focus on your basic needs. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 6, or I should say verses 3 through 7, look at Elijah's response to Jezebel. And in this passage, we'll see that Elijah neglected some of his basic needs. In verse 3, it says that he was afraid and he ran for his life. So we see he has fear. And then it says in verse number 3 that he left his servant behind. So now we're getting into isolation withdraw from social relationships. Then he says, basically he abandoned his responsibilities because his servant was his responsibility. His servant depended on him for his livelihood. What else did Elijah do? He became overwhelmed. He says in verse number four, he says, Lord, I had enough. Let me ask you, have you ever had an I had enough moment in your life? I have. Especially in 2020. 
Church, I had enough of police brutality. You can say amen when you can. Church, I've had enough of rioting. Church, I've had enough of political smear campaigns. I've had enough of COVID. I've had enough of unemployment. I've had enough of hearing about sickness, death, and dying. I've had enough of media bias. I've had enough of mass debates. I've had enough of societal division. Church, I've had enough. Have you been there? Elijah had enough. We also see in verse number four that Elijah was in a period of despair. What is, what is his response? He says this, God, take my life. He prays for God to kill him. He prayed that he might die. And my question is, did Elijah really want to die? I don't, I don't think he really wanted to die because death wasn't too far away. If he wanted to die, he could have stayed in Jezreel and allowed Jezebel to capture and kill him. Correct? But he flees. He flees into the wilderness. And he's praying to God, God, take my life. I don't think Elijah really wanted to die. I think what Elijah is wanting us to understand is that he was in a period of despair. A period of hopelessness. And what is God's response to his request? God says no. Aren't you glad, glad that sometimes God doesn't answer your prayers? Elijah prayed for his death, and God said, no, I'm going to keep you alive. Church, let me encourage you. If you made it out of 2020, then God has a purpose for your life. If you still have food on your table, God has a purpose for your life. If you survived COVID, cancer, the flu, if you are still here today, if breath is still in your lungs, then God has a purpose for your life. Even if you feel fear, even if you feel despair and heartache, God still has a purpose for your life. He is sustaining you this very moment for a reason. Amen, church. The Bible tells us in verses 5 and 6 that Elijah started to, to oversleep. Here he is in the wilderness, and he's sleeping. And not only is he sleeping, he's not eating. So what does God do? God intervenes, and he makes a meal, and he, he places it on some rocks next to Elijah. Then the angel wakes Elijah up and says, Elijah, get up and eat. You've gone too long without food. You're oversleeping. You need something to eat. God provides for him. So Elijah wakes up and he eats. And then what does he do? He goes back to sleep. <sighs> Elijah meets criteria for clinical depression. If I was diagnosing him in an assessment, I would say, Elijah, you are clinically depressed. You're in fear, despair. You're overeating. I'm sorry, you're undereating. You're oversleeping. You're depressed. Church, let me encourage you this morning that Elijah experienced God's power. Did he not? That God answered Elijah's prayer. And if you read in previous chapters, you'll see how God provided and worked in the life of Elijah. And if God have done, has done many miracles through Elijah's life, God has shown Elijah mercy in his despair and heartache. God has confirmed his presence in Elijah's life. And here, Elijah still had a negative mindset still had a bad attitude, he still became depressed. 
So what's the message? That you can still be depressed and have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. That you can still experience anxiety and still have a relationship with God. That you can still be fearful, sad, angry, and overwhelmed emotionally and still have a relationship with God. There's a misconception that if you are a Christian, that if you are a believer, you won't experience negative feelings. That's a lie, church. They're just feelings. They come and they go. God is present and active even in the lives of the emotionally unstable. Let's move forward. 1 Kings 19, verses 8 and 9. It says, so Elijah got up, he ate, and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So Elijah eats this meal that God has provided for him. And it says that that food sustained him for 40 days and 40 nights. Five-hour energy, Red Bull, Monster, ain't got nothing on God's meal that he provided for Elijah. But there's some parallel here to Moses, is it not? And even to Jesus. It says, Elijah traveled in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, the Bible tells him in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, that Moses talked to God on Mount Sinai without food and without drink for how long? 40 days. And did you know Mount Horeb, the mountain of God in which Elijah is now at, is also Mount Sinai? The same mountain in which Moses was on when he received the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells me that Moses wandered in the wilderness for how many years with the children of Israel? Forty years. Elijah in the wilderness for 40 days. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Jesus fasted for how long? Forty days. Where? In the wilderness. Before he was tempted by Satan. A lot of parallels here with Moses, with Jesus, and Elijah. Elijah returned to Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. I think that is very interesting. And in verse 9, it says this There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? So what was the purpose of Elijah going to Mount Sinai? What was the purpose? I think Moses was wanting to experience God. uh, I'm sorry, I think Elijah was wanting to experience God the same way Moses did on Mount Sinai. I truly believe that. God begins here. And he says, what are you doing? Now, I'm 37 years old. And some things are happening now as I get older that I've never experienced before. Have you ever had a, what, are, what am I doing here phenomenon? <laughs> when you walk into a room, you know you're, you're there for a reason. But you forget why you're in the room. And you're like, what am I doing here? There's a reason I came to this room, but I cannot Remember, this is a really good question to ask yourself no matter where you are in life. Have you ever asked yourself, what am I doing here? The reason I think God asks Elijah this question is because he wants Elijah to self-examine and to self-reflect his location. He wants Elijah to examine his motives, his purpose in life, and his mission. And it's a good question that we ought to ask ourselves at times. What am I doing here at this moment? Why am I here at this point in my life? 
Why am I here at this particular job? Why am I here with this particular person? Why am I here in this particular relationship? Why am I here at this particular church? It's a great question for self-reflection. I know that God already knew why Elijah was there. But I think he wanted Elijah to verbalize what he was feeling and thinking. We call that talk therapy or psychotherapy. I think God wanted Elijah to put into words what he was feeling. Now let me give you some free therapy here. Research shows that when you put into words, when you verbalize what you're feeling, you know what actually calms the brain and helps you to feel better? I'm not going to send you an invoice that was totally free. You're welcome. Point number three, when you've had enough, when life is beating you down, when you feel stressed and overwhelmed, I encourage you to call out to God. In chapter 10, I'm sorry, verse 10, he says this. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and they now are trying to kill me too. This is Elijah's response to God's question, what are you doing here? And so here, Elijah, I believe, has a catharsis moment. A catharsis is a releasing of strong, repressed emotions that will result in renewal and restoration. So he's pouring his heart out to God. Elijah, in his grief and frustration, he ran to the wilderness. He ran to Mount Sinai. Took him 40 days to get there, but you know what? The journey only takes 12 from Jezreel to Mount Sinai. It's a 12-day journey. Took him 40. Elijah, what were you doing for these 40 days? I believe Elijah was crying out to God in his crisis. I can imagine Elijah saying, God, I, I've honored you. I've obeyed you. I've worshipped you. I've committed my life to you. And I'm alone. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. I'm afraid. God, I need your guidance. God, I need your help. God, I need your love. God, I need your comfort. God, I need your mercy. Elijah was experiencing isolation, loneliness, and social rejection. Could you imagine being a believer in God? Could you imagine being a Christian and then being rejected by the very people who claim to be followers of God? Could you imagine being a believer and then being rejected by your friends, your family, and society? And social rejection is real. I don't know if you've ever experienced it before, but it has some very uncomfortable consequences. Social, social rejection increases anger, anxiety, depression, jealousy, sadness. It makes it difficult to concentrate on intellectual tasks. Social rejection can contribute to poor impulse control, and it actually activates the pain centers in the brain. There are people here among us, a body of believers, who have disclosed to me that they feel socially rejected and isolated. Church, this ought to never be in the Lord's church. Amen. So where does Elijah go in feeling this social rejection? Where does he go? He isolates, he withdraws, and he goes to the one person that he knew would accept him, would listen to him, and would love him. He went directly to God. He went directly to God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, 
Peter says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. What is Peter saying? What is Elijah showing us? That we can call out to God in our heartache. Why? Because he cares for us. He wants to listen to us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to talk to him. When you've had enough, cry out to God. Number four, when you've had enough, challenge your negative thinking. Challenge your negative thinking. When we're under stress, when we're overwhelmed, we often have cognitive distortions. So I want to briefly talk about four cognitive distortions that you may experience when you are under stress. Number one, this is something that Elijah did. Jumping to conclusions. So it's interpreting the meaning of a situation with little or no evidence. What did he tell God? He said, God, I'm the only one left. Everyone's trying to kill me. I'm the only one who is dedicated and committed to you and following your will. And we know that's not true. You keep reading in the story, God tells Elijah, Elijah, he says, I have 7,000 in Israel who have not kissed or bowed down to Baal. So Elijah was jumping to conclusions. His perspective was limited because of his current situation. Number two is emotional reasoning. So it's assuming that your emotions reflect reality. And I experience this a lot with some of my clients. Just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean that's how things actually are. Elijah felt like he was the only one left. But the reality is there are thousands more. And then number three, disqualifying the positive. Recognizing only the negative aspects of a situation while ignoring the positive things that are happening. God had done so much in Elijah's life. So many blessings, so many provisions, so many miracles. But Elijah didn't focus on that. He focused on the negative. What about you? What about me? Do we focus on the negative more than we do the positive? Do we focus on our poverty or do we focus on our provisions? Do we focus on our hurt or do we focus on our healing? Do we focus on our sin or do we focus on our salvation? Do we focus on our misery or do we focus on God's mercies towards us? If you focus on the positive, it will instantly improve your mood. That was free too. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 12. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came what? A gentle God was in the gentle whisper. Why did Elijah travel all the way to Mount Sinai? I think that Elijah was expecting to counter God again the same way that Moses did. In Exodus 19, verse 18, it says, Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. This was what Moses experienced while on Mount Sinai when he was receiving the Ten Commandments. And here Elijah is experiencing symbolically what Moses experienced. Did you catch that? What happened after Moses came down from Mount Sinai? He saw the children of Israel. As he was coming down with the Ten Commandments, the children of Israel were at the bottom of Mount Sinai. They had already built a, a, an idol calf to worship. So they were worshiping a false god. And this is the same thing that Elijah had to 
had to address with the children of Israel. So back during Moses' time, the children of Israel were worshiping this false calf, this, this, this idol. And then Moses, out of his frustration, what does he do with the stone tablets? He breaks them out of anger and out of frustration. And then God calls Moses back up to Mount Sinai. And what, listen to what God says to Moses the second time on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6, he says this. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This was God's message to a frustrated Moses. And I think this is the message that God is giving to Elijah symbolically. Why did Elijah travel all the way to Mount Sinai? He wanted to encounter God the same way Moses did. The truth that had been proclaimed to Moses in words was reaffirmed symbolically to Elijah. But God wasn't in the symbolism necessarily. He was in the still, quiet, small voice. It was a prophecy of God's highest expression of gentleness, of compassion, of love, mercy, and forgiveness which both Moses and Elijah would witness on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 17? Jesus went up to a mountain with Peter, James, and John. And it says that he was transformed before them to where his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Here's Jesus on the Mount of Transconfiguration. And guess who's with him? Moses and Elijah. What's the message here? The message that God gave Moses is the same message that God gave Elijah. And this message was manifested through the life of Christ. That message is compassion. That message is God's grace, his love, and his mercy, which is made possible through Jesus. Point number five. When you've had enough, quiet your life. When you're overwhelmed and stressed out, quiet your life. We often look for God in the miraculous, do we not? That's what Elijah was doing. He was on the mountain wanting to see the miracles of God, the power of God. We often look for God in revivals, in healings, in visible leaders, dynamic speakers, in times of divine rescue. We look for God in the extravagant. And we forget that God is also in the quietness. And God often reveals himself there. God also often reveals himself in the, the calm, the silence, the gentle, and the peaceful. So God revealed himself to Elijah in the quietness of fear, the quietness of grief, the quietness of despair, the quietness of depression, the quietness of isolation, the quietness of in the absence of miracles. Isn't God's silence our common reality today? Is God speaking directly to us in an audible voice? Do we see the miracles that we read about in the Old Testament? Do we witness these things today? No, we don't. What is our common reality in our relationship to God? Most times it's silence. But the scripture tells me that's exactly where God is. In the silence. In Psalms 34 verse 18, it says, The Lord is near. He's close to those who are broken hearted. When our hearts 
are broken, when we're in distress, when our life is crumbling around us. God is not far from us, though we feel he is. God is right there in close proximity with us on a very emotional level. Amen, church. 1 Kings 19, verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. This also echoes Moses' experience from Mount Sinai. When God passed in front of Moses, what did God tell Moses to do? Cover his face, right? Cover his face so he could not see God. Because if he did, he would die. Elijah does the same thing. When he, when he heard the still, small voice, he pulled the cloak over his face because he knew that's where God was. Then in verse 13, a voice said to him again. So God comes back to Elijah after displaying this, this, this great object lesson in front of him. He comes back and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? He asks him a second time, why are you still here, Elijah? And what was Elijah's response? I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they seek to kill me as well. Guess what? Elijah's response didn't change. I think Elijah missed the message. His feelings and perception had not changed after his encounter with God. In fact, Elijah repeats the same complaint he had before. It seems Elijah missed the message. You know, sometimes we miss the message too. God speaks to us. He speaks to us in worship. He speaks to us when we read his word. He speaks to us when we sing praises to him. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through Bible class. He speaks to us symbolically as he did Elijah. Do we miss the message? When God speaks to you, are you changed? Does your behavior change? Does your lifestyle change? Does your thinking change? Does your relationships change? Are you changed or are you repeating the same answers to God as before? I believe God asked the same question a second time for two intentions. Number one, to get Elijah back to work. It's a rhetorical question. Elijah, what are you doing here? I've affirmed and reaffirmed my love and commitment and mercy to you. You know that I'm here with you. What are you doing here? Go get back to work. I still have a purpose for your life. Get back to your mission. The second reason I think God asks him again is to ensure him that God is with him, even in the absence of the miraculous. God is saying, Elijah, I'm not going to interact with you the way I did with Moses. But I'm here even in silence, even in quietness. I'm with you. That means I'm always with you, even if you don't see it. And as I come to a close, when you've had enough, get back to your responsibilities. This is what God told Elijah in verses 15 through 18. He basically says this, go back to the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, I need you to anoint some people. Anoint Haziel, anoint Jehu, anoint Elisha. It says, and go to the 7,000 that have not bowed down to Baal. So Elijah is told to go back towards Jezebel. Go back towards your stressor. Go back towards the thing in which you're afraid of. I still got work for you to do. When you're overwhelmed and frustrated with life, prioritize your responsibilities. Sometimes when we're under stress and depressed, we start to neglect things that really need our attention. Prioritize those things. What is most important? And try to get those tasks fulfilled. So things don't continue to overwhelm and continue to build upon you in your moments of stress. And number seven, seek out supportive relationships. Is this not what God told Elijah to do? Go back. You think you're alone, but there's a lot of people that still need to see you and that people that you need to be in connection with. 
Go back to the people that are committed to me, the people that are faithful to me, the people who have not worshipped this false god. Go back to them because they will strengthen you. They will encourage you. And that's the message we need today. Not everybody in the church is people you need to confide in. Amen, church. Not everybody here is here for the right reason. Not everyone here is committed to God. I wish that I could say with confidence that we all are. But everyone who professes to be Christians don't always act and believe how Christians should act and believe. So God tells Elijah to seek out the ones who are still committed, the ones who are still faithful, and go and be among them. As I come to a close, church, have you had enough? When you have, create some distance from your stressor. Focus on your basic needs. Cry out to God. Challenge your negative thinking. Quiet your life. Get back to your responsibilities and seek out supportive relationships. If you're here this morning and maybe you feel depressed, maybe you feel anxious, maybe you feel despair. Maybe you feel like you've had enough. I encourage you to let that be known today so we can pray for you, so we can encourage you, so we can support you and help you with any need that you may stand in need of. If you're here today and maybe it's sin in your life, maybe you're sick of the sin that is consuming you. Maybe you have not responded to the gospel and you've not yet been baptized to have those sins forgiven. Maybe your relationship with God is not where it should be today. The message from today is that God is compassionate, God is merciful, God is kind, God is loving, and God wants a relationship with you. It's a reason why you're here today at this moment. There's a reason why you're listening to this message right here online, because God is trying to communicate his love for you this morning. If you haven't been saved, I encourage you to, by submitting to baptism, to have your sins washed away, and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you stand in need of anything, let that be known as we all together stand and sing the song of invitation. Thank you.